Yeah, so let's, uh, I'd like to call to order uh, a uh, <clears throat> regular meeting of the San Francisco Creek Joint Powers Authority, um, Thursday, September 23rd. It's about 3.35 or so. And if we could have roll call, please. Sorry, Director Abrico? Yes. Director Combs? Here. Sorry. Director yeah. Pine? Present. And I'm not seeing any other board members present at this time. Okay. Okay, so we do have a quorum and let's move on to approval of the agenda. If somebody could make a motion on that. I move. No, sir. Okay, move then second. Um, and we'll have a uh, roll call. Director Brinko? Uh, yes. yes. Director Combs? Yes. Director Pine? Yes. Agenda approved. Okay, okay, great. <laughs> Okay, uh, item uh, number three is the um, approval of minutes of the July 22nd uh, regular meeting. Any, are there any changes or corrections? If not, I also will entertain a motion. I'll move approval of the minutes. Okay. Second. I uh, move then second. Uh, we'll do roll call again. Director Abrika? Uh Yes. Director Combs? Yes. Director Pine? Yes. Okay. Here. I'm here. Gary Crow. Oh, okay. Yeah, and Gary's here too. Gary. So yes. Present. All right. Yes. Okay. Um, next item, well, it's a public comment and so this is an opportunity for members of the public to address the board on any topic or issue that is not on the agenda and just understanding we cannot engage in any lengthy discussions um, and so are there any requests at this point Miko? Uh, Jerry Hearn would like to comment. Okay go ahead Jerry. Uh, good afternoon can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, great. Uh, I just wanted to let uh, the uh, JPA board know that uh, last weekend we held a very successful coastal cleanup day at two sites, one at Cooley Landing and one uh, on San Francisco Creek. We had 150 people at each site and just an amazing amount of garbage and uh, both trash and some useful items got taken out. And once again, uh, we continue to uh, be able to hold these, which is really nice. Uh, and we did it in a very safe and effective manner. And maybe some of you were out there. I know that uh, Mayor uh, uh, Carlos Romero was out of Cooley Landing and, and did a lot of work and got a lot of stuff done by himself. So thank you very much for this opportunity to, just to say that. Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, so now we'll move into our regular uh, business. And, uh, you know, just a quick uh, word on the context of this. So out of our board retreat a few months ago, one of the areas that we felt was a priority for us for this year was to, you know, uh, basically understand the whole Safer Bay, the shoreline, processes that are taking place, uh, our involvement. We know there's uh, one shoreline in San Mateo County involved and then Santa Clara County Valley District. So this is in the manner of a study session. Um, and, you know, we'll get started. Um, I think we will have also, in addition to our director uh, giving us a quick overview, um, we do have some materials in our packet. But uh, as I understand, I think we had also asked um, uh, Len from uh, Len Matterman from the uh, One Shore Line, and then uh, somebody from Valley Water. I'm not sure who, but they will also uh, 
you know, do a, a, a little presentation and then we can obviously take questions and try to understand this more. So, uh, yeah, I had it over. And, and again, this was a result, uh, David uh, Pine, who's the chair of the One Shoreline, and I, along with Len and Margaret, did meet, I think, before our recess, just to frame this to say, you know, it, it'd be good to uh, study this and, and sort of collaborate on understanding this whole area here. So uh, I'll hand it over to Margaret for to begin our uh, review of this. Great. Thank you, Chair Abrika. I hope everyone can hear me okay. I am uh, working remotely from the road. Uh, Kevin, if we could toggle to the next slide. Thanks. So as much of the board members are very familiar with, I want to run quickly through the scope of the San Francisco Creek Joint Powers Authority uh, Safer Bay Shoreline Project. And for the benefit of those attending, make sure that folks are given the opportunity to see the whole context of this very sweeping, very large, um, um, somebody, uh, Dennis Parker is saying he's having connection problems, sorry. Um, so anyway, just to give folks context. On this slide, you'll see in the upper left-hand part of the map is the northernmost boundary of Menlo Park. And in the bottom right is the southernmost boundary of East Palo Alto. Those various colored segments or, or reaches of this project encompass the, entire, say, the entirety of the SFCJPA's Safer Bay project. Different portions of this project have been more closely defined, perhaps because they're simpler, because there are limited options, and other portions of these reaches are less clear. There are either multiple opportunities or the best opportunity hasn't yet been selected. Those are indicated in some of the dashed lines. The scope of this project involves public partnerships with other cities and with other uh, governmental organizations, as well as, well as private entities such as Facebook, pg e and others. These alignments are tentative. We'll be going forward with some preliminary design work and public engagement processes that will help define these reach and alignment alternatives more closely in the near future. Kevin, could you go to the next slide? There's a bit of a pause, forgive me. It should go in a sec. People can take in the view of this lovely slide. So while while we're waiting for the technical process to work its way through whatever electrons need to happen, there we go. Um, some of the historical context, I know many of you are very familiar with this. Um, it goes back to uh, LENS and East Palo Alto's leadership more than 10 years ago. In a 2016 and probably before that, a 2016 feasibility study that described um, the, the extent of, of the East Palo Alto Menlo Park Safer Bay project. The 2019 feasibility study built on that and a 2020 MTC ABAG Dumbarton Corridor study further investigated what was necessary in the area right next to the pg e substation, the Dumbarton, uh, the, the West Bay Shore and Dumbarton Bridge approach. So this has been an ongoing, a long time uh, conversation. There have been inquiries, explorations, many collaborations, and there are many agencies, interested parties, non-governmental organizations who are all actively engaged in evaluating the best paths forward and being active participants in this conversation. Can we toggle to the next slide? And my overview on this is going to be fairly brief to make sure that 
our partners at Valley Water and One Shoreline have a chance to dive into their perspectives, which may be less familiar to many of the attendees and board members. We lose the presentation. Kevin, would it be helpful if I pulled it up on my end? Yep, there we go. It seems to be working better now. Okay. Still waiting for it to reach. While that's waiting, um, the DWR grant is not 1.3 million. It's actually just over 1 million. Margaret, if you're able to, why don't you try to share yours just if you have it open? M mine's not being very responsive. I apologize for the interruption there. I don't know what happened. Kevin, are you screen sharing? No, Margaret, I'm, I'm, maybe I was muted. I, I suggested that you try yours on your end if you have the presentation open. I'm having I some will trouble do that. advancing. Thank you. Okay, I will do that. Okay, sharing my screen. Uh, give me a moment. Okay. So picking up where Kevin left off, the Safer Bay project funding status is we have multiple grants. Going back to the earliest one received was from the Department of Water Resources. The next one that was successfully applied for was the FEMA HMGP or Hazard Mitigation Grant for East Palo Alto. And this was Palo Alto is considered the sub recipient or the, the, the uh, primary on the grant. That grant is ostensibly for $17.2 million. We won't be able to actually receive that money until FEMA goes through their environmental historic uh, preservation evaluation. We anticipate grant funding being available in late 2022 or 2023. So there is a, a gap, not only in timing, but in dollars. So we're working through both of those timing and dollar issues. The next substantial grant, again, not in hand, but uh, signs are pointing to yes, for a $50 million plus the local match of $17.8 million match from pg and &E Facebook for a FEMA BRIC grant where Menlo Park was the subrecipient and the lead on that grant. What we are estimating at this moment is that the total project cost will be about $130 million. This does not include the Caltrans portion of the Safer Bay alignments. So of the $130 million approximately with all of these, uh, with the FEMA HMGP and BRIC grants, uh, all told about 87 million has been secured. We understand that a very rough estimate of 
the Caltrans Dumbarton Highway 84 project is likely to be in the realm of a billion dollars. Right now, the players and the responsible parties for the project include East Palo Alto as the lead on the HMGP grant, although the JPA is providing technical coordination and uh, technical support. Menlo Park is leading on the BRIC grant, and again, the JPA is providing technical leadership. We're also providing leadership on the programmatic CEQA for the entire project area. The JPA is continuing to seek and hopefully secure additional grant funding for overall project needs. We take an active role in communicating and coordinating with members, uh, our own members, as well as um, uh, outside entities and other NGOs on what's happening with the project. Um, we are, at, for example, actively involved in staying in touch with Caltrans to make sure they're aware of our work and we are aware of their process. And we will be leading discussions with property owners and stakeholders and spearheading all of the um, public outreach and education through our community partners. And then I can toggle over to Rochelle Blank's slides. So if you give me just a moment, I will tee those up and be ready for Valley Waters remarks. At this point though, that concludes my context setting remarks. If the members of the board have any questions for me, we can do them that at the end or now as is your pleasure. Yeah, why don't we go ahead and do the presentations and then we'll do questions. Rochelle, I can ban it for you. Okay, great, thank you. So this is Rochelle from Santa Clara Valley Water District. I'm a deputy All operating right. officer. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I, thank you. Um, I, I've been involved with the Shoreline Project uh, since as far back as 2010. Um, and this picture here shows the majority of the landscape in Santa Clara County. And if you go to the next slide, please. Ah, uh, Rochelle, I'm having trouble advancing it. I don't oh, know That's why. okay. When you get there, I'll just keep talking. So okay. um, from, we began our, a feasibility study working with the Army Corps and signed on with us was Coastal Conservancy. And we began that effort in 2005. And at about 2010, five years into it, it was becoming evident that working on the majority of the landscape all at once was very difficult and going to be a challenge. So in 2010, we began exploring, looking at how to phase this project or look at an isolated piece. And the first piece was what we call EIA 11. And in CORE's terms, EIA is Economic Impact Area. And it's essentially the North San Jose area between the Guadalupe River or Alviso Slough and the Coyote Creek um, on Santa Clara side, the Coyote Creek Bypass. And it included the ponds a 12, 8, a 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and, and the city of San Jose owned a 18. It included those ponds. Um, the Coastal Conservancy is a partner because prior to this in 2003, they had bought up a good number of the former Cargill salt ponds, a 1 through a 17. And the city purchased a 18, and Valley Water purchased a 4. And what they soon realized is that in order to advance those ponds to restoration, they needed a, a flood risk management levy in place to protect the low-lying communities along the shoreline. So that's how we ended up moving forward with the shoreline project. Um, in 2011, we advanced the shoreline project from um, 2011 to 2015 to an authorized project. And it was approved by the chief of engineers and moved into preliminary engineering for about two years and then construction for, uh, in about 2018. And it was funded with a fixed fund amount from the Bipartisan Budget Act of approximately $124 million. Um, as we continued to work with the core on this and progress it, we did ask CORE to begin looking at future phases of the shoreline efforts for the remaining EIAs one through 10 and they did receive funding in 2019 to pursue the second phase of the study in EIAs 1, 2, 3, 4, all of 1 through 10, but 
about three months or first quarter into that effort, they again decided it was just too much to bite off and then broke off um, the Palo Alto majority EIAs into its own feasibility study and are seeking funding, which they have not received yet for a future phase three for the majority of the Sunnyvale area. Um, EIAs four and five really overlap with the Coastal Conservancy South Bay Salt Pond Project and uh, would really be realized through that effort. Um, for the EIA 11 construction piece, maybe the next slide would be helpful. And having issues advancing. That's okay. So the, the, it was basically, we're now looking at three phases of the study, phase one, two, and three. When the next slide comes up, you'll be able to see those phases. Uh, we're in phase one, it's construction now. But something that we've really come to realize is that the 2015 estimate was approximately $174 million. And in the first two years of the preliminary engineering and design period from 2015 to about 20, late 2017, that cost had grown to 194 million. And flash forward to today, the core tried to put out for construction the first three levy reaches, one, two, and three. And when they put them out in 2019, it came back nearly double the engineer's estimate. And they could not award the contract. They need to look into headquarters, USACE headquarters said, we need to look into what's driving these costs up because we may have to look at all of this, all of EIA 11 area and um, examine the cost drivers. And so the project was not awarded in 2020 as planned and all of 2020 was spent looking at cost drivers. In the end, we did get this back out for advertisement, the first three reaches, one, two, and three, which is basically from the marina to the Don Edwards Center. And it's roughly two miles. We did get that back out for advertisement and it came back at 130 million. So it grew about $40 million. And in order to get that awarded, Valley Water and Coastal Conservancy had to step up, step up and request an amendment to the project partnership agreement where we said we would pay the federal shortfall. And that is again, because of the bipartisan budget act, which funded the construction is a fixed dollar amount and can't be increased. So the new cost estimate for this project has grown 267% to $518 million. The core is only contributing $124 million right now. Valley Water is responsible for nearly $400 million for the remainder of the study. We do have funding um, and have received grants. We received the Measure AA grant for approximately 61 million. We have uh, state subventions qualifications. We're trying to um, go ahead and progress and, and get enter into our final cost share agreement and start, start setting up so we can seek uh, reimbursements from that. However, it looks like right now we can really only afford the first three reaches with the core, which is from Alvisa Marina to the Don Edwards Center. So that's kind of where we're at with EIA 11. We're kind of facing some challenges to be able to see how we can complete this project. In phase two, um, the feasibility study has begun. It's about $3 million in three years per the core's smart planning process. However, to date, we're now seeing that the core needs to request an exemption to increase that funding by almost double to close to 6 million and by almost an additional three years. So something we're learning is that these projects, and I'm sure we also see this on the, on the San Mateo County side, are, are large, complex, and becoming costly. Um, some of the things that we did, discovered in the first phase there in construction, putting this out for two years is that dirt is really expensive. It's now approaching $50 a cubic yard and upward. And these are largely dirt projects if you're gonna really look at making them all levees and include Ecotown. So some challenges we're facing um, is construction right now has a long window. We only have funding for half the project. For phase two, 
uh, the, the feasibility period itself is doubling and the core needs to get approval of their exemption waiver to go beyond the three year, three by three process. And we're still kind of waiting for finalization of that. And the future of phase three, no funding has come through as of yet. So with that, I'll just kind of end and we can probably start discussions. I think at this point, we will toggle over to Len's presentation and his slides are um, uh, high memory. So he is going to be running his own slides from his screen share. Nico, can you facilitate that at this time? Okay. Hi. Hopefully you can hear me. Yes. Okay. We can. Hello, everybody. Um, all right. Thanks, Miko. I'm going to screen share. And here we go. All right. So um, just to back up a little bit, uh, I was asked not just to talk about the shoreline of um, East Palo Alto and Menlo Park, which I will, but also just to give an update on the district as a whole, what we've been up to, what our mandate is, things like that. I, I think the last time the board heard about the district was probably during its formation, um, which was uh, you know almost two years ago now when the legislation was signed. So, um, so does that sound good, Chair Abrika? Uh, yes, yes, I think that would be good. Yeah, good. Yeah. Great. Um, okay, so. The way I start this narrative is San Mateo County, of all California counties, is the most vulnerable to the first three feet of sea level rise in terms of population, underrepresented population, property value, homes, contaminated sites, and we're up there um, in the in the United States in terms of a number of people uh, impacted by by sea level rise. The first few feet. The graph on the left shows. Um, the comparisons between different counties, the taller the bar, the more uh, residences and orange bars represent whether those residences impacted by sea level rise are below the median income for the county. Um, and, and yellow represents whether on average they're above the median income. So San Mateo County really has a, is a huge issue for us. And the county and the cities weren't well positioned to deal with this. Um, issue. On the bay side, there are 12 cities. On the coast side, there are two cities and a lot of the areas in incorporated county. There had been a flood control district since 1959 um, in San Mateo County, and they were the member agency to the JPA for a long time. Um, but they didn't cover all the county. They covered about 10% of it, including about 10% of the bay side and none of the coast side. And so it was felt that that was that, that, that that flood control district um, wasn't well equipped uh, geographically to, uh, to address the issue that was so huge for the county. Um, and so many cities uh, connected on the shoreline uh, or adjacent to each other on the shoreline, um, they couldn't act alone independently to address this issue. So um, the district was created. Uh, we take a holistic view to the threats incorporating uh, climate change uh, threats into traditional kind of flood issues. Uh, as well as the need for regional stormwater and drought resilience. Um, geography, a holistic look at the geography in terms of multiple jurisdictions and uh, the objectives of our project. Also a holistic view in terms of using uh, green infrastructure, private lands um, and turning waterways from, from something that had been a, considered only a threat into, a, into an asset to integrate into communities. Um, so we were established January 1 of last year, uh, startup funding from the county and all 20 cities in the county for the first three years. And, um, and our priorities for this fiscal year, which uh, started um, about two months ago, is to complete our first construction project. There is a, I'll talk about that project in a second, um, but it's under construction right now. Uh, to advance big multi-jurisdictional projects uh, along uh, shorelines of multi multiple cities uh, in, or the, and or the county. Um, work with cities and developers uh, so that 
the public uh, infrastructure and private property is is planned. So we're working on zoning and uh, and general plans and specific plans with cities and uh, to develop a long term uh, stable source of funding for this work. Um, and uh, and we're where our board has been exploring uh, has a, a subcommittee to explore uh, potential parcel tax, a countywide parcel tax to do climate resilience. Um, and it would potentially include both uh, resilience on the water side as well as on the wildfire side. So here's a snapshot of much of the county and various projects. Uh, the ones that are in light blue are projects that we're leading. Uh, so the one closest uh, to San Francisco Creek in the bottom right is the project under construction, Bayfront Canal and Atherton Channel. There's also an emerging project around all of Redwood Shores, which is Redwood City, San Carlos, Belmont, and the county, and where the airport, San Carlos Airport is. Um, and then a regional project in Burlingame and Millbrae shoreline. And we have a flood early warning system um, that's countywide that we're working on to, to develop. There are other projects where we're partners on or potential partners. And there are two main, pro two huge projects that we plan to connect our work to uh, Foster Cities Levy, as well as a plan that San Francisco is is uh, is working on for shoreline protection. And then, of course, we're a member agency of the JPA, and uh, and we'll talk about that yellow line there along the shoreline uh, in a second. Um, this is the project under construction at Bayfront Canal. Uh, Bayfront Canal runs. Um, let's say from left to right on the slide, and it drains just uh, where Marsh Road uh, hits the bay at near Bedwell Bayfront Park. Also, Atherton Channel drains into it from the bottom of the screen heading east, and, uh, and it's a frequent source of flooding for five mobile home parks that are in Redwood City and in the county. Um, and this whole area is in the FEMA flood zone. Um, so they had a they had not just a long-term need in terms of sea level rise, but an immediate need. And there was a project uh, that started planning in 2009. And, um, and it had some um, all, almost pretty much 100% designs. Um, it, when the, as of the time the district was established, um, in 2020 or January of 2020, we certified the CEQA document. We put together a funding agreement um, among um, Redwood City, Menlo Park, uh, and uh, Atherton and the county. Um, and we also secured the permits. So this was a big part of our activity the first year was to get this project under construction, uh, which it did get under construction in May of this year, and it will be completed um, by the end of January of uh, 2022. So it's moving along quickly. The basics of the project are take water out of Bayfront Canal underground, deposited into the US Fish and Wildlife Service ponds. By taking the water out of Bayfront Canal, we uh, during the high tide, the water can't drain through this tide gate you're seeing. In fact, what you're seeing right now in this picture is during a high tide and a rain event, water is actually moving upstream from the bay up Bayfront Canal. And that's exactly what we're trying to solve is, is that issue um, by diverting water into the fish and wildlife ponds. And here are a couple of pictures of it under construction. Um, the bottom right picture are two culverts that will soon be underground under the roadway um, and diverting that water uh, by, by February 1st. Another project, big regional project in, at Burlingame and Millbrae, this is SFO. They've been working on a shoreline protection program to encircle the whole airport. Their largest reach of the project is this blue dashed line. Um, and they do not need to do that whole reach if they tie into projects to the north and south of the airport. And so we're, put, we're uh, the lead agency on a project south of the airport in Millbrae and Burlingame. Meanwhile, uh, Burlingame in 29, late 2019, December, came out with a study of its uh, sea level rise vulnerability and uh, Millbrae did that in August of 2020. So they had, we had these three independent efforts going on um, and it really made sense to kind of align them and connect them and, uh, and our agency is, is, is doing that. Um, so that's what it looks like. Uh, the pink line represents the shoreline of Burlingame and Millbrae tied into SFO in the upper right. And we also have to work on the creeks that run from the bay upstream um, as, as far as they would be impacted by the uh, bay plus sea level rise. And so that's pretty much to the Caltrain tracks, the BART tracks over there. And, um, and what the projects have agreed to do is share uh, common objectives, the technical information, 
Um, we're working on what it looks like to share environmental mitigations. Um, they've agreed in concept to share costs um, and to utilize uh, land that they each have uh, for, the, for the benefit of the project. Um, the good news for us is this project received some targeted state funding from Kevin Mullen um, that was in the budget that was signed today. And, uh, and so that's this project's gonna be definitely going forward with uh, planning and design uh, work over the next couple of years. And, and uh, just say we have a, we have a brick grant um, that is, uh, all, it's been a, approved by Cal OES and forwarded to FEMA, um, and we're pretty confident about it. It's a small grant for planning work uh, on, this, on this project. On development, meaning um, land use development. Uh, so the cities, as, as you all probably know, require that new development in the FEMA flood zone build to a certain elevation. Um, but that doesn't, uh, that doesn't talk about elevation related to climate change. And so what we're trying to do is uh, promote um, cities utilizing future conditions for climate in their planning. And this does two things. It incorporates protection um, for a new development and their surroundings, um, and it uh, enables the private sector to join in the project, um, which the cities really want. And so we're working on zoning ordinances uh, with Burlingame specifically. There's a, a, an ordinance related to sea level rise that's moving along through the process. Um, also working with South San Francisco on their general plan um, and uh, Red, with Redwood City on the specific plans um, to, uh, to build resilience for future conditions. And so here's an example of a map of future conditions that, uh, that is envisioned to become part of the new Burlingame zoning ordinance for the Bayside. And, uh, and we're working with developers. Uh, this is a developer along Colma Creek that's building on two sides of the creek. And in exchange for land rights, uh, they'll be doing improvements to the creek. Um, and then this is a picture of what we don't want to see, which is development right on the shoreline. This is in Redwood City. Um, and with sea level rise, there's really limited opportunities to protect this property other than build, at this point, build a wall right in front of their front door. And those are the decisions that we're trying to avoid uh, cities making is, is to consider uh, a climate, uh, future conditions, and give, it, give the projects enough space uh, and to enable to adapt to that. Um, in terms of elevations that we're working with, the daily high tide, uh, th really throughout the, the county and, and into Santa Clara County is somewhere between six and eight feet, um, the mean high tide. And the feet, so the FEMA 100 year is about four feet higher than that. And when you add two feet of required freeboard, you get to 12 to 13 feet. And our objective in our projects is four feet above that. So it's six feet above the FEMA 100 year uh, four feet above the re required free board, free board height and about 10 feet above the daily high tide. And, uh, and so our, our objectives to avoid future risk and avoid the more costly and challenging work of retrofitting protection later is, is to plan for it now and build in marshes for their flood protection environmental benefits. There's a group at UC Santa Cruz that is doing research with us on, um, on the the effectiveness of marshes in terms of their flood protection benefit. And, uh, and we're looking forward to that information, especially in regards to Redwood Shores and, and Burlingame. And then of course, like Valley Water, we try to build trails into this, into these, this infrastructure at any point that we can. So zeroing in a little bit, and this is the last slide on, on the area that, that we're um, most interested in. Here's, um, Here's uh, San Francisco Creek on the right side of the image, uh, as, as Margaret uh, discussed when her images, Menlo Park is on the very left side. This is Marsh Road. You see what's labeled here is Willow and Highway 84, Dumbarton Bridge is up there. So the kind of the big picture, which Margaret also um, provided, um, this is maybe a slightly different way, a dumbed down way to look at it, um, is the, the Creek's Beta Highway 101 project that was completed in December, 2018. Um, it's really also a sea level rise project because the 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 elevation of the levees is the same what I just what I just showed on the previous slide. It's 17 feet, which is 10 feet above the daily high tide, and that's irrespective of creek flow. And so I think of it as a sea level rise project as much as it is a creek project. So that's been completed. Connected to that is the JPA's uh, project uh, as part of SAFER. And this was the subject of that Cal OES FEMA grant that Margaret talked about. And then of course, there's the BRIC project, which is um, 
submitted by Menlo Park, the JPA as a partner, um, of course, PG&E and Facebook and a lot of agencies including One Shoreline provided uh, letters of support, that kind of thing. Um, and then Menlo Park is working on the entrance to Bedwell Bayfront Park. Um, right now, as far as I know, it's still kind of a landscape effort, but it, I think I think there's a lot of conversation about this being part of the, of the sea level rise protection because it has to be, because without that little stretch, um, the rest of it doesn't work in terms of getting people out of the FEMA flood insurance program and reducing risk for the eastern part of Menlo Park. And then one shorelines piece comes uh, north of Marsh Road, if you will. And, uh, and that goes all along the levee between the Cargill property and Menlo Park, and then it transitions to County and Redwood City. Um, so the, the, the two other pieces of this that you'll notice there are gaps. One is that yellow, white dashed line that just appeared. That's Bedwell Bayfront Park. It's high ground. There's really no reason to build something there as far as we know. And then there's a question mark in terms of how this gap will be filled, what the alignment would look like. Um, as uh, and, and there is there is potentially going to be another study. There was a study of this area before um, that MTC uh, ran, and um, and there's a there's talk of another study potentially to look specifically at that gap and how the protection would cross the highway. And that concludes um, my presentation, Margaret. So I'll stop sharing and turn it back to you. Thanks, Len. Yeah, so let's uh, let me go to the board first for um, any questions on any of the presentations, and uh, you know perhaps we can keep track of the questions uh, as well as later we have uh, public and staff from other cities or entities any questions they might have, even if we don't have all the answers today. But uh, let me let me uh, go to the board first and. I do know that uh, Vice Chair uh, Drew has to definitely leave by 4.30, so I'll, I'll call on him first for any questions or comments you might have on any part of the presentations. Uh, uh, Drew? Yeah, I think, thanks, Chair Briga. I, I don't have any questions at the moment. Okay, all right. Anybody else on the board um, have any questions or comments on any parts of the presentations? You, you know, just, just jump in, I guess, at this point, whoever has it. Nope. A question on, on timing. There's a lot of different projects that have been briefly discussed today. But I, I think it's safe, is it, it's safe to say that the project that's most imminent would be the East Palo Alto levees? Is that is that uh, the case? I think the part of the construction that's most imminent may be the East Palo Alto levees. But before we get to that, we need to release our NOP and go through CEQA, at least at the programmatic level, and then specifically at the project level for those reaches. So that's the first step. And we anticipate doing that first, um, of course. Yeah, any other questions? If not, I can uh, just open it up for any member of the public. Um, and of course, that includes other staff members who may be uh, joining us from other jurisdictions. Uh, and Nico, maybe I'll just ask you to keep track and see if people raise their hands or uh, we can do that. We have any public comments or any staff members from any of the member yeah. agencies at this time? I don't ha I haven't received any comments. Okay. Uh, or you know, having heard from the three uh, presenters, any other things that you want to add, or maybe even cross questions from the different presentations? Uh, we have a hand raised right now, Director. Okay. All right. Well, let's call on that person then. Mark Dunan, do you want to go ahead and speak? Yes, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me now? I guess I'm yes. the... Yeah, we can hear you, yeah. So yeah, hi, my name is Mark Dinan. I live in East Palo Alto. Um, I'm actually in visual eyesight of the Lowmeister Trail um, right now. 
Um, to follow up on a question, I mean, there was kind of a nebulous answer as to when this would start. Um, there's going to be huge impacts in East Palo Alto, and it's really a good idea to prepare the community um, for major construction like a levy. Is there any rough idea of when this would actually start? Is this like two years out? Is it three years out? Is it six months out? I mean, is there, I know there's a lot of bureaucracy that this has to go through, but is there anything that, that we can say to people who have questions about, you know, roughly what this is going to look like and when it's going to be planned and when it's going to, you know, they're going to start? Sure, Rika, I can speak to that question. And yes, perhaps. Go and perhaps Tess and Kevin can chime in with some more details. Yeah, sure. um, um, Mark, it's, it's going to be at least three years before actual construction will happen. We need to go through a process of environmental review that includes a lot of community outreach and education. So there's going to be an awful lot of opportunity and we're going to be very proactive about reaching out to the community so that folks are very well aware of what this is going to look like how it may impact their lives. Construction projects are noisy and dusty and intrusive. And you know, while, while we can do our very best to mitigate those kinds of impacts, there's no getting around some of the large yellow pieces of equipment. That said, um, as we progress through that environmental review process and refine our designs, there will be a lot of opportunity for the public to see what those designs are going to look like and to provide their input. What we're looking at in terms of different strategies vary depending on the reach. We have more room in some areas, less room in others. And in some places, we wanna make sure that we have transition zones or ecotone levies. So there's likely going to be a mix of solutions depending on where, what part of the project we're talking about. But in terms of East Palo Alto, if we had shovels in the ground before three years, I would be over the moon. I don't anticipate it any faster than that. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Any other uh, questions um, coming up or? Jerry Hahn. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, Margaret, you and I have, were having a conversation about the uh, the intersection of some of the other building projects in East Palo Alto and the uh, the uh, flood uh, or excuse me sea level rise projects. Could you explain a little bit about that? I'm really thinking more about the uh, the uh, pollution efforts and things like that. Sure. So as folks may be aware, there is an area of East Palo Alto being considered for redevelopment. A lot of that property is considered a brownfield. It has legacy contamination that has been remediated, although it's been remediated to a, a condition satisfactory perhaps for industrial use, not for residential use. In a couple of locations, we are looking at property redevelopment capping soils that have residual contamination. The capping of those contaminated soils is not something that the JPA can undertake. Only the property owners are responsible for those activities, remediation activities. For us to pursue our uh, sea level rise and tidal flood mitigation project, those properties need to have that remediation, that soil needs to be capped because they are right up against one another. They're literally overlapping. So a levy would be part of a cap and the soil fill for the redevelopment would be maybe part of a levy buttress or a levy extension on the landward side. Um, so one has to come before the other. The redevelopment has to figure out what it's going to be and the soils need to be capped. That kind of remediation needs to be um, underway or completed before we can complete our shoreline um, tidal and sea level rise mitigation project. Jerry, I hope that explained what, what you were thinking of. Are there other contamination issues that you had in mind? Um, uh, some no, people have. That, that was what I, I just thought that uh, we, it would be a good idea to bring that up when you're thinking about timing, because that means that 
uh, the timing for the, S, the JPA project is somewhat dependent upon the timing of all of those other efforts and, and the agreement to actually do that kind of work moving forward with those developments, at least in those few spots. Right. And, so and really about timing. We, have, we, we, we do hope that that timing is fairly closely aligned. You're right. We can do some, you know, working to the left, to the right, but we're, we're hoping that the timing is, is fairly closely aligned. Right. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah. Any other uh, questions? It looks like Mark has another question or comment. I do. Yes. Hi. Um, I guess I just wanted to ask this up front. I mean, it may be completely um, uh, impractical, but one of the issues we have here in East Palo Alto are these big power lines running through the community. Um, there's already been multiple plane crashes, uh, one last week, um, plane hit power lines. Is it feasible to put some sort of, I don't know, a conduit through a proposed levy that would both underground the power lines or is that completely un unfeasible or infeasible? Um, it's something that um, would be a real win for the community if we could both get a levy and get rid of the high tension power lines from PG&E um, that run right along the shoreline. Mark, it's a great question. I don't know. Uh, I have no idea about the technical feasibility of undergrounding transmission level power lines. Um, because PG&E is a working partner of ours, I'm happy to ask them that question. Uh, I, I don't have the answer now, but I, we can follow up and put that in our meeting notes following the meeting. Yeah, that would be wonderful because my impression is that there's going to be a ton of permits that need to be pulled for this. And if it's mm -hmm. kill two birds with one stone and they don't have to handle the permitting um, for this major construction project, it might be a little bit easier to get through. Um, I don't know if it's unrealistic. I have no idea, but I thought I'd ask because uh, if you don't ask the question, you'll never get the answer. So thank you. Yeah, sure. I, I, can, I can say that the cost of undergrounding transmission scale electrical is probably outside the budget and scope of this project, but to the point of it being a hazard and there being an opportunity for PG&E, it is absolutely worth the question. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, so I have one question that um, the, in some ways the discussion questions that uh, Margaret put up there uh, sort of uh, touch on in, in certain ways. But so I, you know, my assumption is that uh, the, the staff or, you know, the, the directors or, or staff uh, in these three entities have obviously for this presentation, but uh, just in the matter, of, in, in the course of, in, in the course of business, you might say that they do consult with each other, they check in, they, you know, what, what's going on, et cetera. So I, I'm actually interested in hearing from the three of you some ideas or some issues that you see that the JPA, for example, or uh, the Board of Valley Water or uh, One Shoreline sort of need to keep uh, keep an eye on, or you know, need to begin thinking about further. Um, and it could be in any area, whether they're you know jurisdictional issues, financial issues, et cetera. So. I occasionally do that with just in the city council for me because the staff are the ones day to day doing all the work and they run into areas sometimes where they either need direction from the board or the boards need to or the councils need to uh, explore that. So I'm I'm actually just curious to see what what kinds of questions do you guys have now or things that we could put on the table for further discussion later on that need to be addressed in some way. Maybe there aren't any, but just thinking about it. 
Director Rubrica, um, uh, Margaret here. One of the questions I have, and this is aimed, I think, for, for Rochelle's consideration. Santa Clara Valley Water District has a very robust relationship with the Army Corps. San Mateo County does not. It's my very rough understanding that the reason for that is that unlike Santa Clara County through Valley Water, there isn't a ready source of community match funding in San Mateo County. So I guess a, a, a question of Rochelle, what is it like working with the Army Corps? And a question for Director Pine and for Len about the contemplated future of um, the result of a future ballot measure. Do you see that working with the Army Corps for San Mateo County is something that would benefit shoreline projects? So this is Rochelle. Um, working with the Army Corps has its challenges. You are stuck with their processes and you have to go through feasibility. Um, they're now following a smart three by three planning. So that has been a little improved in that feasibility. It limits feasibility to the three years. Um, and it's supposed to streamline it. But as you can see with the phase two area in Palo Alto, they are looking for an exemption to expand it three more years. So you just have to be willing to work through their processes. Funding, it can be a challenge at times because it comes through regular um, annual appropriations or as in the project for phase one, EIA 11 area of North San Jose, funding came in from the Budget Bipartisan Act and they're saying it's fixed. They can't have any more funding added to it. So it, it, it can be challenging. You have to understand their processes quite well to be able to um, carry a project through with them from beginning to end. And you know, getting grants along with the federal funding can be challenging as well because you, a lot of the grants have limitations such that um, it's reimbursements and reimbursements, it could be based on the local, local share only or no overlapping of state shares if you have a state partner as we do with the Coastal Conservancy. So uh, that's what I can share about that. I think at the end of the Palo Alto feasibility study, um, discussions will occur with Palo Alto and that is this the process they wanna continue in and how are we gonna fund this? Because as, you, as I noted on the price tag for EIA 11, it's now in the um, 500 million range and one agency alone can't do this. So that's what I offer up. Thanks, Rochelle. Yeah. I guess I, I would just, I think Margaret was also addressing that to us. Um, I would just say for all the reasons our Rochelle articulated, we're, we're not actively pursuing a core partnership um, on our piece, but on it's it's kind of easy to say for for this area because our piece is really picks up north of Marsh Road. So it's a relatively small piece of the footprint. Um, but you know, I, I mean, as we as it, if the brick money comes through, um Obviously, that's another federal, different federal source with substantial local um, private funding through PGE and Facebook. If that funding comes through, that's a that's a good narrative for for how you don't have to do a six years of feasibility study to uh, to achieve a project. You can you can do a what we did for a feasibility study, which was maybe eighteen months. Um, and that was locally funded, uh, and and some DWR money, and um, and then you're ready to to submit for for other funds. So there there are a lot of funding options out there. I I, I wouldn't hang my hat on the core um, for for our work. Yeah. Thanks, Len. Any any other questions or comments? This definitely has been very. Uh, uh good to to just kind of get an overview of the the you know the three entities and 
it's just a reminder that we we share the bay and we share the shoreline and we share all the risks and the possibilities as well as all the challenges that that come with it but um yeah any other you know, I, I would just say, uh, Chair Rika, that um, if you just look at the area of Brown Bedwell Bayfront Park, it's complicated. And mm -hmm. there are three different, essentially three different projects there. And we're all we're all uh, related. And, you know, the JPA board relates us, uh, as you indicated, really, in the intro to, to this part of the agenda. Um, but but Menlo Park is doing the entrance. You know, we are in conversation north of Marsh Road along Menlo Park and uh, Redwood City about what the future of the shoreline will look like there with, with people who are working on that. And then, of course, there's the brick project that the JPA and Menlo Park are taking the lead on from Bedwell to, to the yeah. PG&E substation. So even in just that small piece, um, there's really a need for coordination and, and and it, it's not just the JPA or one shoreline. It's a lot of it's Menlo Park as well as a city because they have that that particular project that they own. Um, and and each of those pieces is critical. Uh, without any one of them, even the small just entrance to the park, it, the whole thing doesn't work for its objectives. Mm -hmm. um, and then and then you have the the bigger gap at the highway. Uh, you know, along from how do how do we get from essentially the north end of Tate Street to the PG&E substation north of 84. And mm. that's that's a big question. It relates to the Loop Road and the and the Ravenswood Business District development. And there's right. just it's a it's a big topic. So so I, I guess I'm just saying this is super complicated and and I think we all have to stay diligent on the need to work with each other uh, on a relatively regular basis about the progress mm. of our planning. Yes. Uh, yes, that, that was a good uh, good summary. I would say that given the yeah the multi jurisdictional nature of this, uh, but very active. I think now at least a lot of things are going on. A lot of, all the entities are now paying attention to this. I think so, but it will require uh, more regular. I think checking in. If I think the staff is probably you know does more of that just by the work, but even at the decision-making level to, to stay, uh, uh, yeah, getting updates or just uh, try to anticipate issues or as they come up or see how we can all work together. So, yeah, I think that's good. Okay, so I think if, you know, if there's no other questions or comments, uh, definitely appreciate everyone's uh, participation and the information you brought to us and we'll stay um, you know, we'll stay connected and in touch. And, um, you know, I think with the JPA, we're very lucky. We have representation from Valley Water with uh, <clears throat> Gary and then with David uh, on one shoreline. So we are, uh, and then we have our different cities and, and stuff, but yeah. Okay, well, uh, I think that will conclude our, our study session then. And once again, thank you everybody. And um, we'll go on to the uh, executive director's report. Okay, thank you. Hey, thank you, Director Abrika. Um, so uh, keeping things relatively brief since you've already read this in your board packet, uh, reporting on the progress on our Reach One downstream project. We have we received a responsive bid for selecting our uh, for monitoring and reporting. The HT Harvey contract will be on uh, your agenda later. Interpretive panels and a commemorative bench um, are in the design stage and nearing finalization. We're working out some details about fabrication and placement, and we are aiming for an end of the year conclusion to that process. And my slides don't want to advance very quickly. It'll be the end of the year before my slides advance. Huh. Ah, there we go. Page two. So we're continuing design evaluation and minor changes to reduce impacts. We have been slightly delayed on our LEDPA submittal because we are working through some cultural resource questions, which uh, 
if there are any questions, Tess can speak to, but it does not seem like there are any impediments. We just had to go through an evaluation process. Uh, we've made significant progress reaching out to affected Palo Alto property owners from whom easements may be needed. And our uh, US Army Corps of Engineers CAP 205 Team Charette's process uh, has been um, convened and concluded very successfully. And together with our US Army Corps of Engineers folks, we have a tentative date of October 25th for a community outreach uh, event that for us provides an opportunity to do community updates about what's happened uh, since the last community update. And it's also their NEPA scoping meeting uh, that satisfies their NEPA requirement. And uh, on to uh, working our way up the watershed. Initial site investigations have been completing, have been completed. Uh, we're working on uh, set design that may be feasible from an engineering standpoint, uh, provided certain assumptions. The information gaps memo has been drafted for a geotechnical and environmental evaluation. We held a consultation with NIMF on uh, the 15th of September, and we will be completing a feasibil feasibility technical memorandum by the end of this year. So things are moving along well, and our collaboration with Stanford continues to uh, grow and be collaborative and a, a positive relationship. So for SAFER, back to the, pro the topic of the day, we had a very effective presentation to the BRICS committee on September 1st, and we got their agency feedback, and that's being incorporated into our pending notice of preparation for CEQA which is planned for release in October. And we are working right now on applying uh, for a Measure AA grant. We're going to be asking for two and a half million dollars for each of two years. And that money will be used for programmatic CEQA for the entire SAFER project and uh, project level CEQA for East Palo Alto reaches and some additional supportive studies and public outreach and education. On the operations and admin side, our banking transition is complete. Yay. Uh, on your uh, ag consent agenda today is the conclusion of our social security insurance and CalPERS balloting. We conducted, as some of you might know, a very successful collaborative webinar with headquarters FEMA. On August 24th, we learned about FEMA's new risk rating 2.0 which will change the way insurance is, flood insurance is um, evaluated according to risk, according to new uh, actuarial information, updated actuarial information. And it is more equitable and uh, will go into effect uh, in, in October. We had over 160 people there and all the results of the webinar are available on our website. And Miko and I are hard at work creating a board handbook. That's that's the uh, that's the uh, director's update. Happy to take any questions. Any questions? Um, not hearing any at this point. Uh, we'll continue then with the. Uh, Item seven, which is the consent agenda. You just mentioned one item, I think that. This consent item, about it yeah. or? Well, this consent item is the culmination of the um, formal process that required us to clarify that um, the JPA employees who have had Social Security deducted from their paychecks, as well as the 403B deduction for CalPERS, that for both CalPERS and Social Security to have no confusion about which retirement benefit should prevail, that we have elected both. This merely concludes the process. Okay. 
All right, so if uh, there are any questions, and if not, I can entertain a motion for this item. Uh, I'll move our approval of the CalPERS SSI, SSI Section 218 resolution. Okay. All right. I'll second. And uh, we could have a roll call on that. Director Abrika? Yes. Director Pine? Yes. Director Carmen? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Motion carried. Next uh, section is some action, action items, number eight, a uh, couple of resolutions. There we go. Uh, resolution approving our consulting services agreement. This is the responsive bid that we had from HT Harvey and Associates for mitigation, monitoring, and reporting. As you may recall, the first three years of that um, permit requirement was part of the downstream project project funding. The consecutive seven years uh, is now uh, being shared by all the members. And this is the first of seven years um, for conducting that required mitigation monitoring and reporting under this contract. Okay, any questions on uh, this consultant services? And if not, then also we'll entertain a motion. Keep it going. Well, we'll take turns. I'll, I'll, <clears throat> I'll make a motion um, uh, approving a resolution for the consultant services agreement for mitigation, monitoring, reporting, and the uh, rest of the text there. I'll second that. Okay, move then second, and we'll have a uh, vote. Director Kremen. Yes, Director Kremen is no longer on the call. Yes. So you want to continue with the vote or so? I don't believe we have a quorum. We don't have a quorum. Oh, I thought. Uh, Oh, you said uh, Gary Gary stepped out? Yeah, he's no longer on the call. Oh, okay, yeah. All right, well then um, we'll leave these two uh, items for the next meeting. Right? And uh, yeah, busy times. So, uh, you know, are there any, David, you have any comment or any questions on their or comments information? And uh, nothing today. Nothing today. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I think with this, we uh, will at this point just adjourn and just bring back those two items for the next meeting, and we'll be fine. Okay. Okay. We'll do. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye.